300,000 subscribers. It's been quite a journey, and today I live in a very different place to where I started out. In fact, many of you have come along on that journey over the course of a whole lot of years. Over that time, the channel has evolved in many different directions, starting out with space games, moving towards some simulations, but of course, space is and always will be a central theme to this channel. In fact, just last week, Private Division arranged for travel and accommodation to the European Space Agency in the Netherlands. It was a fun-filled few days, which we'll talk about in just a moment, but it all feels a very long way away from where I started out, with videos more or less exclusively on Elite Dangerous. Over the years, however, that content expanded and evolved in a lot of different directions, and along the way, I picked up a very nice audience and made a lot of good friends, so really want to say thank you to everyone for watching the videos, helping out, supporting content, and pretty much doing everything else that has made this channel what it is today. But things won't stop there and will continue to evolve and change, and whilst my focus will definitely remain on the current crop of games, I will also, in addition, be covering Starfield, as well as, of course, Kerbal Space Program 2. In fact, right here you can see a very short clip from the uh, European Space Agency taken inside of a full-scale mock-up of the Columbus module. This is used in reality in the International Space Station, and yes, you did see a Kerbal standing right in the centre of that. You can actually see the new KSP trailer on the screen right here, which was just released. So during the event, I did get the opportunity to get some hands-on experience with Kerbal Space Program 2. I can't talk about that just yet, but give it just a few days and I'll be able to release that video on the Kerbal Space Program 2 gameplay and my playthrough session. So then, moving on, I wanted to make this video somewhat of a channel update. I've spoken a bit about reaching a 300k, which is a real milestone for me talked about what I was up to last week, now I want to get to a few of the questions left by my Patreon supporters. So let's start with Mike. Congratulations on 300,000 subscribers, thank you. Different YouTubers get into making videos for different reasons, some out of sheer passion for the subject, some think they might have a talent for it, and some for sheer fun. They also have different expectations for how things might work out. What was the reason for you? And how have the outcomes met or surpassed your own expectations? And what surprises have come along on the way? So that's a really interesting one. Now, if I'm being perfectly honest here, I kind of fell into YouTube. I didn't really seek it out, not as such. Back in 2012, I think like many people, I was both excited and surprised to see that Elite Dangerous, was going, or Elite at the time, was going to make a comeback. It made its appearance on the Kickstarter in December of 2012, and I got into the Alpha or the Beta Access around about 2013, very early 2013. Now, there was quite naturally a lot of interest in the game, and I was also very passionate about it. So I took the opportunity to put some footage from the game, as well as a little bit of uh, narration, I guess you could call it, onto that video and posted it for other members of the community to see. So making that content was something I really did enjoy, so I kind of carried on doing it, both with Elite Dangerous. Back at the time, I also made a few videos on Star Citizen. I think either my second or third video on the channel, actually, was a Star Citizen video. But regardless of the game that I was covering at any one time, one thing I really did become passionate about was the drive and desire to make videos. It was something I found that I really did enjoy. As I said early on in the video, that has evolved and changed quite a bit, partially because of my own experience and developing techniques and methods and, I guess, skills for making, hopefully, better videos that more and more people enjoy. But also, perhaps on the other side of things, YouTube has itself changed over time. The algorithm kind of pushes content creators in one direction and another, and that, fortunately in some cases and unfortunately in other, in other cases does have an impact on the type and style of content that does get created. So, yeah, that's one of the issues. One of the surprises, I guess. But another surprise that has surpassed my own expectations is been the uh, response from the audience themselves. Seeing so many people actually enjoy the content, wanting to hear from me, wanting to hear my uh, take and thoughts on things, and also wanting to see the uh, type of videos that I do enjoy making. One of the other things that has surprised me is there's been the number of opportunities that have come along on the way. So very nice to be involved 
in so many different things. I've met a lot of people, uh, both within the various gaming communities, but also from a whole variety of different companies as well. So, yeah, all of that, whether it's come from community members, whether it's come from friends and family, or whether it's come from a variety of companies, it's all been very much a surprise and generally a real pleasure to be involved with. A lot of uh, nice things, nice experiences that I've had the opportunity to uh, get involved in. Now, Mike does have another question here. Being a YouTuber means that you have to maintain a constant presence on social media and forums such as Discord as well, all of which can be pretty unpleasant sometimes. What coping strategies have you developed to deal with these instances and what advice would you offer others to help them maintain good mental health in forums and communities? So this one is definitely a really tricky subject. There's no getting away from it if you're in the public eye, no matter to what lesser extent or greater extent that is, you are going to ruffle a few feathers. And whilst yes, you certainly have to maintain a social media presence after all, simply posting a YouTube video and then reading some of the comments, well, that is a social media presence. You're also, generally speaking, going to be involved in other areas of your community as well. And some of that can, as you point out, get unpleasant at times. Nowadays, uh, well, how do I cope with that? In part, I tend to simply ignore it. There's a few communities out there that I was heavily involved in quite a few years ago. Uh, not going to name names, but I've cut right back and simply don't visit them or have a very, very small presence there now. So for me, with these things, it's all about value. What type of value do they hold for me personally? Now, I'm not talking about monetary value here or anything like that. I'm talking about pure emotional or intellectual value. And for me, the best emotional and intellectual value I get from the respective communities tends to be on my YouTube videos in some of the community uh, comment sections. Uh, some of the comment sections can get pretty bad. I think that's uh, well known for YouTubers, but other videos can be a real pleasure. So it tends to depend on the comment section, but yeah, from time to time, I certainly like to get involved in that. Also over on Discord, I like to have a presence there and chat with people. That's always a lot of fun. But if you're talking about other communities, whether they're forums or Twitter or wherever else, well, I'll tend to weigh that up on a case by case basis. And some of the communities, despite me being involved in pretty heavily in the past, just today don't have any emotional or intellectual value for me. And I think that can be a, well, true to real life as well, isn't it? No matter whether you're talking about online interactions or offline interactions, What's the point in getting involved in relationships or communities that generally tend to be unhealthy for you personally? Always better to cut your losses and just move on and maintain the healthy relationships. There's also another way of looking at this, another way of phrasing it, far more blunt. When you know an area is full of crap, it's usually best not to go walk in there, right? Now, moving on, we've got another question here from Heijo. Apologies if I'm pronouncing your uh, name incorrectly there. I'm absolutely terrible when it comes to pronunciations. But anyway, I played Elite for around five years since I found it on PlayStation 4 until they dropped support for console. It was my first MMO I committed to. Leaving it behind feels mostly good, but a bit bitter. Would you feel it is pref preferable? preferable MMO lifespan devs should aim for, and what would be the optimal way to end the game when it eventually gets to that point. So again, this is one of those tricky situations, isn't it? The, how many MMOs have actually come to the end of their lifespan? A few certainly have, but others have been going for many years. My first MMO was Ultima Online back in uh, 1997, I think, 1998. And although that game it does have a small community right now, it is still going. That's, what, 24, 25 years later. So, yeah, that one has a very long lifespan. Another one that you could look at, EVE Online. I played that back from its beta in 2003. That's 20 years ago this year. So, another one that has a long lifespan. But the thing of it is, the current times appear to not be such a great time for live service games. Now... Some people possibly won't compare or consider live service games and MMOs to be the same thing. That would really depend on where your perspective falls on all of that. In my opinion though, it really does feel as though the games that have come out in more recent years, so at the past six, seven years or so, 
Live service MMO games have come out within that time frame tend to struggle far more than ones that came out prior to that. And that's why we're seeing games like Marvel's Avengers and Back for Blood being abandoned so soon after their release. And again, in my opinion, I think a lot of that comes down to the fact they just have a very poor gameplay. I'm not saying that's why Elite Dangerous has been abandoned on consoles. I think there's other more technical reasons for that, I suspect that they just had trouble getting much of it working on consoles themselves and it was easier and far cheaper to simply abandon the game and uh, kind of leave it as it is. But whichever way you cut it, it's not a great decision. Now as for winding these types of games down, I don't really know if there is an easy way to do that. Ideally, if a game has to be wound down, it should perhaps happen when there's a sequel on the cards and we saw some of this happen with Overwatch where uh, the players were just migrated from Overwatch over to Overwatch 2. And I think that's really a best case scenario. Unfortunately though, not every game is going to have that option. And I guess ultimately, that is the price we pay for playing live service games and games that have an online component, which yeah, nowadays is an ever increasing number of games and in some cases even seems to be a single player games. But what are you gonna do? It's hardly ideal. And, you know, I kind of missed the days when it wasn't that way. Show my age there, perhaps. Now, Robin says, congrats on 300k subscribers. Thank you. With your interest in Flight Sim, have you ever piloted a real aircraft? No, I haven't piloted real aircraft, but it is something I really, really want to do. So uh, maybe at some point in the not too distant future, I'll get the opportunity to try that out. Definitely something that I'd uh, like to do at some point. And anyway, moving on, Axon Tear. Hello there, mate. Um, I'm probably uh, too late by now, but no, you're not. Here is my question. How do you balance the challenge of actuality versus editorial content in your daily uh, weekly content creation routine? Now, uh, Axon Tear goes on to explain uh, what he actually means here. And it's the difference between the two types of videos. On the one hand, we've got uh, news pieces. So, uh, the types of videos where I talk about upcoming updates and news releases and uh, current patches, things like that, versus other types of content where I express things such as opinions, ideas, and what well, my current take on any situation. So how do I balance out dealing with both types of content? Well, for me, it's actually a pretty simple, and largely this is because I tend not to plan out content too far in advance. Now, some of the bigger content videos I do plan out, but for the most part, I tend not to plan out any more than a week or maybe 10 days. The main reason for that is because generally, news can drop at the last minute. So, news on Elite Dangerous or Starfield or Kerbal Space programs can appear very, very quickly, and it has a pretty quick turnaround cycle. Axentia cites my recent Exion video as another type of video where uh, essentially I did like a mini review. I tend not to do full on reviews, but this one was kind of an impressions video of the uh, space game Ixion. So content like that, that tends to also not be planned too far ahead. Well, you know, I say that it kind of is. If I know there's a release date coming up, then I'll try and make a window for new types of games or new types of content on that release date. But again, that generally has to have a pretty fast turnaround. Due to the nature of YouTube, if there's a new game being released today, for example, or tomorrow, you really want to get a video out on that within 24 to 36 hours or so. If you go past that, the YouTube algorithm simply uh, won't recommend the content. And this moves me on to another subject. People often talk about building content for audiences. So, you know, are you being a bit clickbait with this title? Are you being a bit uh, provocative with that thumbnail? None of that is ever about the audience. It's never about baiting audience. It's never about trying to trick the audience into clicking a video. What it is about is trying to trick the YouTube algorithm into recommending the video. Now, YouTube itself is very, very finicky. And, you know, sometimes it just simply doesn't recommend content. It's not a matter of whether people watch the content. You could look at my stats and maybe in a future video, I'll actually uh, show this depending on how many people are interested. But sometimes a video can have an exceptionally high watch time. It can have an exceptionally high click through rate. But for whatever reason, YouTube doesn't simply, simply doesn't recommend the video to a wide audience. And that's despite the current viewers having clearly enjoyed the video. 
So that's just one of those cases where you have to play the YouTube game. And as I said, it's never ever about tricking the audience into thinking content is one thing or the other. It's simply about trying to work to the YouTube algorithm, which is something I really, really don't like doing. But if you want the views on your videos, YouTube kind of force you into that position. But at any rate, that kind of goes into weighing off the uh, two types of content, whether it's editorial or whether it's more news focused. There is a balance there, but generally, for me at least, I tend not to plan out too far ahead. Although if, you know, if I could have my choice here, I'd much prefer to be able to plan out a lot further in ahead. Final question here from Avon. Uh, congratulations for 300k, I think, so thank you. I'll keep my suggestion concise. How do you balance the hours you play video games with healthy lifestyle? Example, exercise. So exercise is very, very easy nowadays for me uh, because I do live right on the edge of a national park and there's absolutely amazing uh, hiking trails around here. Do a lot of hiking, a lot of walking, so get quite a bit of exercise that way and that's never really a problem. As for playing video games, that tends to be a little harder. Um, it's one of those subjects that you'll hear a number of YouTubers actually talk about. There's the games you play uh, that you cover on your YouTube channel. So for me, Elite Dangerous, uh, Kerbal Space Program and uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator, all of those do get quite a bit of time investment in them, both for the purposes of content creation, but also because, uh, well, I do enjoy playing them as well. But then it comes to finding time to play other games that I don't necessarily cover on my channel. And this may be something like God of War, Ragnarok, or it could be my current game I'm playing, Returnal. But those games are a little harder to find time to actually play, but I try and find a few hours a week to play them here and there. I think God of War uh, took me about six weeks to complete. It's not exactly a long game. That gives you a bit of an idea of roughly how often I get to play at those types of games. But nonetheless, I do really enjoy those. So there we have it. Thank you for all the uh, topics that you submitted there. Always a pleasure to uh, make these types of videos. And also thank you again for the 300k milestone. And thanks for coming along over the previous few years. It really has meant the world to me. As always, uh, thanks for watching. And I'll catch you guys and girls next time.